I've called the talk the anatomy of a modern quality management professional. Now you won't see the word modern there because it would have spoilt the flow of words, but it's meant the word modern is meant to represent different from perhaps what the quality professional might have done in the past. We're on here, are we? Oops. Okay. Right back to ancient Greece, at the times of Plato and, and um, the great thinkers of Greece, there's always been this controversy over governance. And there's been two aspects of governance. One has been the improvement of the prince. This is where all the skills are pushed into the, 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 ki the prince or the king, and he has the ability to govern from, from direct rule. And you can take that through to modern times in terms of leadership. It, when leadership uses all their skills to manage a business. The other alternative to that was the system that uh, civilizations such as the Spartans developed their systems and the Romans developed their systems and the quality came out of the system as opposed to the effort made by the, the prince. And that you see going backwards and forwards down the ages where you get companies that are either dominated by leaders at the top or you see companies that are dominated by the system. A good example of that is Sony which was dominated by the the man himself, that when he went, the company suffered from the lack of systems. So neither one or the other one is right or wrong, it's how you pl play, play the, the game, the quality of the individual. And when you look, think about it, people like architects follow the prince route. The architect has all the skills pumped into him, the education pumped into him, he draws, draws the, the drawings of a ship and such, then he delegates it to the master craftsman, who again is education of the prince because he's taken education and the quality comes out of the craftsman's hands. It doesn't come out of a system as such. So it's always worth bearing that in mind when you look at any system. Are they following the prince route or are they following the system route? You've got companies like Nordstrom, the American department store, where they have a quality manual of one page. He says, you are empowered to make whatever quality decisions you, you wish to make. And if you're an expert on shoes, you can buy whatever shoes you like for the company, you can sell whatever you, you want to the customers, and vice versa. So that's a good example of the Prince approach to quality. Going back to the CQI, the, really the birth of quality management or, uh, in the UK came about uh, at the time of the 1916 Shell scandal. In 1916, Britain was, or England, Britain was about to fight the Battle of the Somme, and they were 30% short of shells for the battle because the factories couldn't produce enough good shells to, uh, to meet the demand. The second thing they found was that of the shells that they fired, up to 30% of them didn't work. Now, the, because this, the battle itself was, this, was not a success and a lot of people were killed that day, um, they were looking for scapegoats to blame. And one of the generals, I think it was French, told the Daily Mail about the situation on the shelves. He said, we lost it because there wasn't enough shelves there, and secondly, the shelves were not working properly. Anyway, he was fired for his troubles, which probably suited him because he it got him out of the war and he could retire early. But um, what the Ministry of Munitions did was to send teams of inspectors into the munitions factories of the time and give them the, the authority to, in, to enforce quality control on the processes. And that meant taking gauges into the factories for them to follow, use the gauges and to look at the results before they were released to the front. Now from that activity, in 1919 I think it was, the, chart, the Institute for Inspectors was formed, which is where we started from, the CQI. That's, that's the link to it. In a parallel way, um, in the States, Frederick Taylor developed uh, scientific management and he came to London in 1910 to speak at the Royal Society 
and he wasn't accepted very well by British professional class and such. So scientific management never really took on in Britain to the mid-30s and such. But anyway, in the States, his methodology of separation of labour by function led to the, to the first quality de uh, department being set up at the um, Hawthorne flat factory in, in Chicago and the first quality manager being appointed who was Dr. Duran, famous, famous name. He had the, the pleasure of being the, the world's first quality manager of the modern era. There have been people in the past in, in China and, and um, Egypt and such. So from that uh, function, they had, they had an inspection department and they had a department of statistical methods. And the, the people that were running the statistical methods were doing experiments, both inside the factory and out, out in the field, to come up with more reliable quality. Beyond that, we, 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 in the post-war world, we had the massive quality transformation that came from Japan after, uh, after the work of Duran and, and Deming there. And it was that pressure from that transformation that again changed the way the quality profession was governed. From a situation where the, the quality function was the policeman and the, the, who ran inspectors and engineers and all the rest of it, it was changed to a return of the governance back to the people who owned the process. So operations re received the um, inspectors back and, and so on. And we're going to talk about a little bit about that. And then, so out of that has come a for form of modern role for the quality professional. What do we do anymore? Because in much like the British Empire after the Second World lost its way, you know, what, what its role was, the quality profession is some respect in that, that void even to this day. We haven't got devised a new way for us to be working. But I hope some of the stuff we see tonight will show you that there is a way from. There we go. This is the, the bones of what I th see as the modern quality management uh, professional. I'm not going to go through them, we're going to go through each of those individually. Just for those that don't know your history, the first uh, signs of inspection or quality control were with the Egyptians, where they employed people to measure the stones. They measured them at the site that they were produced, and then they measured them again when they were put into position. And so that was going on for a couple of hundred years or so. The, in, during the Middle Ages, the, the professional guilds were developed with the idea of one, keeping a closed shop on their jobs, but secondly, to protect the level of quality that was being produced by the individual guilds. With the arrival of the Industrial Revolution, it was no longer possible to rely on in, individual professionals to produce quality at the, the volume of parts that people wanted, and also the speed that they wanted. So we, that had to change. And what happened was, was the move towards the use of statistics, certainly in mass production, to um, control processes. And that is certainly the case today in, in many mass production industries like the automotive and the white goods industry and other people that follow, follow that route. But it does apply also to, to the... Um, a lot of the aerospace companies as well, and other companies that followed that route. Along with that, in parallel almost, became the, uh, the arrival of military standards. The first military standards, there's always arguments about who, who, who brought the first one out. But certainly the, the American mill spec of 1956 is generally recognised as the first military standard, although I've spoken to some Americans that claimed it there was a, a, a standard before that in 1945. All the way back in 1916, 1919, there were inspection standards. And those inspection standards that were set up by the Ministry of Munitions were after the war adopted by most of the defence companies like Rolls-Royce and such as their quality standards. 
So they were using those standards before the, the mil spec came out. Beyond that came a NATO standards based on the mil spec. The automotive industry developed their own standards based on the mil spec. And after, eventually we got to 0524 where the UK defence standards were, were first, first saw the light of day, followed by the civilian versions of them that many of you will probably reckon, remember. I put this one up because before he died, Dr. Deming looked around and said, there's a lot of d destruction in our society. And what are the causes of this destruction? And it was to do with the, the merits in the schools, incentive pay, bonuses, numerical goals, under misunderstanding of variation and lots of other things of that nature. And he wrote about this and that was his last lesson before he went. Of course, we, we didn't listen to it and, we, and the, the, the great crash that came along afterwards was a, a good example of all those things. How the, these forces of destruction destroy the world, the society we live in if we're not careful. What Dr. Deming did leave behind was this economic chain reaction, which is as right today as it was when he first produced it in 1950, where what he said to the Japanese, he said, you're down and out now, but he said, if you work on improving your quality, you will automatically improve your productivity, but the productivity will reduce costs, Re lower costs will produce lower prices, increase your market share, stay in business and provide employment. That, that is the message that we're trying to get over to the politicians. That if, if, you could, if, if you take the quality management route to improvement, you cannot fail, we cannot fail. And that goes against any form of competition that we may have. There's always someone in the room that likes quality costs, so I stuck this one in to say that quality costs are important but it's not a thing to be focused on. But of course, it is true that the more we spend on prevention, the less we get on, on uh, quality costs. But I, I have to say in all of my career, every single quality system I put together, I put quality costs in there because someone wanted it, not because I was, <laughs> think it was the right way to go. What I normally did was get the finance director to give me a list of all the costs and all the rest of it, and that's what we collect. He collected it, it went into our spreadsheets, and that was the quality cost. It told us that we were squandering variance. Most of the time, what we're looking at, the, the accountants stick so much money, 1%, 2%, 3%, into the budget for variances. These are the things they can't control. And if, most of it's the quality cost stuff. So it's useful to have it as a, a weapon to aim improvement at which is why it's there, but wherever I've gone, I've always set that as, as the objective, not to, that failure costs should never exceed more than 0.1 of sales. Anything more is, is like giving profit margins away. And when, in this day and age where profit margins are very rarely more than 5%, uh, 1% or, or so, is not to be sneezed at. Another thing that's changed very much so from the original mill specs, which were mostly built around detection. Because remember they were mill specs. And the thing for the military is they, they wanted to be able to use anything they had when it reached the battlefield. They didn't want to have to send parts back to, to suppliers and all the rest of it. So they would take samples, statistical samples, and if the sampling program told them they had a reject rate of whatever in there, they'd be quite happy to run with that. Now you cannot do that with a, a car plant. If you're making 2,000 engines a day, you're not in a position to deal with 5% reject because it would disrupt the whole of the production line and there wouldn't be the means to, to deal with it. So what came out of the 80s, the transformation at the time of the Japanese 
advances in quality was a system, the very systems that changed the strategy from detection to prevention. And in that strategy was something called advanced quality planning that we're going to look at. A massive avoidance of waste, reducing of waste. Classification, what is critical to qualities. So the concentration is only on the critical things, not on the, on the rest. A massive attempt to reduce in variation on, on um, processes. The, the discipline of abiding by standards. Get, everyone follows the standards once it's set. The aim for predictable processes. The theme of when you buy anything from a supplier, make sure you buy on process capability, not on price alone. If you buy on price alone, you won't know what you're buying. You buy on process capability, you know how, how good these processes are. Now, we, I've used that every single time. And it, it's one that keeps going out of favour, especially when buyers come back with low prices and such. But put that clause in there and suddenly you'll see a, an even playing field. And the last one, the less <coughs> cease dependence on inspection and test to achieve quality. That, I would think, applies to your industry. That the amount of inspection and testing going on is probably far greater than what it could be if you knew your processes were stable and capable. But anyway, as a general principle, they, these are principles rather than, than absolutes because sometimes there's a need to inspect. When you, have, when you want to get extraordinary quality into a product, then you may do mass inspection on it. Or you might do a pre-shipment audit to get to a higher level so the customer sees a higher level than that may have, that may have gone out. But either way, in principle, not relying on inspection to achieve quality. At that time of the changeover, we saw this decentralization of traditional quality management resp responsibilities. When quality went to business, it became a business case rather than a quality management itself case. <coughs> quality planning went into the projects. Inspection and NDT into manufacturing. Supplier quality assurance to procurement. Software into systems engineering. And patrol inspection finished up on operator control. There were just some of the things that were happening in the changeover about 20 years, 30 years ago now. And a couple more. Goods in which inspection went under manufacturing or procurement and first party audit went to third party audit and policemen, the, inspection, the quality department went to collaborators in theory. So what is the new role of the quality professional? What should he be? Well, I'm often told he's the quality, quality conscious of the company. I remember being wheeled in front of the, uh, the um, director at uh, Wharton, the top, one of the top operations director. He says, you're the quality <coughs> conscience of the... I said, oh, I'm responsible for all what's going on out there. No way, Jose. But, it's seen that they are the quality conscience of the company and when things are not so right, they have to make that position clear to, to whoever their managers are. Secondly, translating the customer's quality requirements and expectations into the planning process. That could be very difficult to do on occasion, but that's what they should do. And know what is critical to quality. That's a, a very important role for the new quality professional. Aim for quality process, uh, process capability on all critical to quality processes. And audit outgoing product from the viewpoint of the customer. How will a customer look at this when he receives it? And the last one, and very important to all you project managers here, or project engineers, project by project improvement. We must never run a project that we don't learn a lesson. And what are we learning? when we run a project. What are we learning? Yeah. Remember the, the prints and the system? What are we learning? Both really, aren't we? We're learning personally, but the system has to learn. The system should learn what we did right on that project and what we did wrong, and what we can do for the imp to improve things in the future. Because it's either the system let it, let it go wrong, 
or people didn't work to the system and uh, that discipline has to be reinforced. Interestingly, last week uh, we had the uh, rail crossrail project at North London branch and we had their quality director, quality managers, supply chain managers and all that stuff. One thing that came out of that, they're, they're doing incredibly well compared to their previous projects. They're normally behind time and normally costed over, cost overruns. This time round, they're six weeks behind schedule and they're 20 million pounds behind budget, which is not too bad for that construction industry. When I, I said to the quality director, what's your biggest problem? He said, people not abiding by the standards. And that's an interesting thing. He said it's better than it was previously because now we insist that they abide this. Now we do the tests that are laid down and we found things and stopped things going wrong. And that's meant that we've progressed a lot faster than what we should do. So that was a lesson they've learned from that project. Hopefully to take on to HS2 so they can reduce their, their variance costs. So the quality professional role, absolutely vital in all this. Any questions? So looking at it at a strategic level, this is the age of the quality CEO. There's more quality CEOs being appointed now than there has been in 30 years. Toyota, after their dramas in the last few years, have appointed CEOs in every region of the world. And the, the idea about that is they have responsibility for communicating on quality to the top table. I've never seen a German company that doesn't have a quality <coughs> director on the main board. BMW, quality director. In the family member, they give it to very special people. Mercedes, on the main board. Um, Volkswagen, the same. They believe that quality is made in the boardroom. And if there's not a, 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 a voice in the boardroom to stop doing things for financial reasons alone, their, their task is just to bring the subject up and to stop it. So, executive communication on quality is essential. And it's a role of the quality professional at the highest level. Customer perception audits on outgoing products. Know what the customer is going to receive. Now, it depends on what the product is, of course. I'm talking about industrial products, whatever it is, open the boxes, look inside in the same way as the customer's going to see, you'll find all sorts of things. Tear them down. Tear down is one of the great disciplines for assembled products. You want to find out what the quality is on a product and tear it down and you'll see. Is it clean enough? Does it have swarf in it? Does, are the birds removed? All the basics in life. But you won't find them unless you tear the thing down. So build it into the contract. There's so many, so many um, products you'll, you'll tear down through the life of the project and you'll see what's going on inside. And what do we do with the data that we get from tearing it down? Any ideas? We put them on a control chart. So we know what the customer perception audit level is so that when you do the tear down and then you keep that data and you can demonstrate to the customer how good the, the quality of the assembly is. It's amazing how quickly and easy you get to get into really serious questions. Audit of quality methods. A quality system has quality methods attached to it. The role of top management, quality management, is to audit those to see whether they're still right for the, for the business. Are we doing things that we shouldn't be doing? Is there things out there that we, we could adopt? And, um, and bring in house. Six Sigma was a good example of that. But uh, some of the other techniques might be more relevant to that company. Coordination of, of, of improvement projects. One of the roles that quality management often get these days is the, is the coordination role. And by that, I mean all sorts of things. I'll, I'll show you one from BAE in a moment. It might be things like idea systems, getting ideas then from people. It might be process improvement team activity. It can be all sorts of uh, project improvement planning act activities and so on. So all those sort of activities, because in theory the quality function has the skill, skill pack to do these things properly, 
They get the responsibility for coordinating them. Consulting for quality management, especially at the top level, people need to be, to be um, mentored about what quality management is and how it will affect the performance of the business. So that's a job for, for top management, but it could also happen in the middle. It may be a new, new operations manager, it might be a project manager that needs someone or other to advise them on quality management. Because um, to make all this work, quality has to come first. How many people work for companies where quality first comes first? So how many, how many people work for companies which are profit first? <laughs> there you are, you see much, how much work we've got to do before we convert them all. It's not an easy one. It's not easy because most companies are measured on their last quarter's profits. And if they're not making profits, they've got the financial papers on top of them and, and got the board on top of them to do something about it. But the companies that uh, are quality first are the ones that stay there for by the decade. They're responsible for training in quality management across the, com across the company. And the, bit, the biggest difficulty there is when you, you uh, relocate the, the responsibilities for quality out to operations or, or whatever the function is, the people that are trained up in quality for that generation are going to leave. They'll be followed by people that are employed that won't have had that quality training. So it's incredibly important that you have a transfer of, of knowledge from one generation to the next on whoever fills the places in, in process. And again, we're talking about new methodologies that come along that may be adopted. So that's it, more or less. This week, last year, we produced a paper at the Institute called The Future of Quality, which was accepted by the Institute. It was then presented to the BSI, where it was accepted as the BSI's position paper. And it was then presented to ISO, 9, ISO uh, TC, TC176 um, Subcommittee 1, 2 and 3. This was our input to the new, new revision. And one of the things we, we wanted to do, we wanted the principles, which were, I think, eight at that time, they're now seven. We wanted the quality first principle. Now, we didn't just dream this up. We went and looked back at uh, Ishikawa's book, Total Quality Control, and he's got a chapter on quality first principle. And everything he said in that is true. And so we tried to persuade ISO to adopt the quality first principle. The convener of this the committee that's doing the revision doesn't agree. He didn't accept it and it was not included on the principles. In fact, they took one of the principles, two, two principles out, they took system, systems thinking out and they took variation out which is not very good. So we've put a letter of complaint into our institute and we've also put a letter of complaint into the BSI and also TC176. So the debate is not over with, but there it is. Quality has to be number one objective. I'm, I don't mind taking any bets on that uh, that's not the case. Quality and safety, of course, are opposite sides of the same coin. Every safety problem I've ever seen has got a quality element to it. Either, either the, the part was not made properly, it wasn't serviced properly, <coughs> or it failed because it wasn't designed properly. Product and service first time capability, quality comes first because it delivers happy customers, productivity and profit margins. Make parts right first time, you haven't got rework, you haven't got scrap, bring your profit properly bring your prices down. And prevention, not detection, should be the, the, the modus operandus. Companies that have stable, predictable management make lots of money. A good example of that is a company called Robert Bosch. 
It's a not-for-profit organisation. It's been making money for the last hundred years, and the way it's going, it will make, make it for the next hundred years. It's and it's based on quality, or quality management. Another role that we have is of the. Uh, the, um, the, the quality professional is the quality planner. And this should be about 20%, 25% of activity should be on quality <coughs> planning. Not detection, quality planning. That's the time you want to get in. In the design processes, in the, in the manufacturing processes, in the suppliers processes, wherever, wherever it is where the planning is going on, it's needed. An input from, from quality professional. At the strategic level, sorting out the strategic aims and objectives, what position is in the field, where are we, how competitive are we against our competitors, go out there and buy a competitor's product, bring it back, strip it down, measure it, see what it's like, see what's good about it. Policy deployment plans, one of the great things that the Japanese have um, pioneered on is uh, policy deployment. And the idea is to get from policy down to the, to the point where the policy will be deployed and to see the results of that. And this is a function of bottom-up, top-down management strategy where everyone's involved in determining what these plans should be based on the people on the shop floor and people at the top. When you get everyone buying in together, top-down, bottom-up, you get consensus and amazingly things ha actually happen when you get to that situation. Most companies do policy downwards. It gets stuck in the middle because the middle manager never has time to implement the policy. Product quality planning we've talked about, we're going to come back to and, and knowing what is critical to quality analysis. This one obviously involves engineering, design, marketing, customers. Knowing what those things are, is the key to producing quality pro products. And of course, I think this came from, from Volkswagen, prevention of errors in the engineering process has reduced defects in the manufacturing process. And for every defect that you've, you um, prevent in design and manufacturing design, it costs you $1,000 in production. That's how much it costs to, to rectify it. This is um, a system that I put together at, at uh, BA Systems, so I'm not going to spend my time going through it. Just goes to show the activities that a quality, a modern quality professional would get into on a new product. And it starts with teamwork and working together, project by project improvement, the lessons learned from the previous projects, what went wrong, what went right, what do, what do we learn from, from this, what, what have we done to change the system? What have we done to, to improve the training? All those things, formally in, in a plan that one project manager hands on to the next one. Because one thing I found out about project managers, everyone wants to do it their way. Yeah? Frank Sinatra sings that song for them, and that's the way they want to do it. And when they get it wrong and you say, well, you, you didn't follow it. Well, I did what I thought was the right thing. But anyway, that's very, very important. Front-end systems, design, FMEA, produce critical to quality characteristics, feasibility analysis, process flow charts, value stream management and all that stuff that's a, a lean discipline these days. This goes back 30 years, by the way. Process FMEA, which is a very, very useful tool to identify potential uh, risks before we go into production. And the, and the rule is that you don't let any of those risks below, uh, above 125 risk priority number go forward, or you, what you try to do is design the risk out. The key to it is designing the risk out. Reduce the number of risks you've got, you're, you're improving the likelihood of not, them not happening, happening and, and you improve the reliability. Then you've got the three control features, that's process capability assessment, <coughs> know what the process capability is on your critical to quality characteristics, Know how much variation is caused by the measurement system. People, it's, it's, it's one that people overlook. 
you'd be amazed how much variation is caused by standard measuring equipment. And people don't even know that they're doing it. And uh, there wasn't even a British standard on this subject until 20 years ago. Before that, it was just not part of the way they did their engineering. And the last one, preventive maintenance is in whatever form that you, you, you take it, is an essential method tied up with capability to prevent processes going out of control. Control plans help the operators understand what their, their role is. The secondary role on that is, is it's there for the supervisor to observe that the operator is following the instructions laid down. This has a two-way meaning, this one. It's more important to the supervisor than it is to the operator. Because if the operator is experienced, he won't need an instruction to tell him what to do, and he'll resent having to look at it. So it's there for the supervisor to observe that the process is, is running right. Or it might be someone from higher up wants to come down and see how well the process is running. Some industries don't like first article inspection. Certainly car industry, defence industry, white goods industry, they all use this discipline as a statement of conformance. If you can make the parts right to join once, you can make the parts right to join more often than once. And for that reason, a fair is usually a quite a strong discipline. And having a 90-day review after you launched all this to see how well we performed in all of that stuff. Any questions? I think I'm wrong with that. This, this is really to show quality professionals where they fit in to the overall system of events. From systems engineering model, the V diagram sets out to <coughs> determine the activities that will happen at every stage of the project, from determining and managing customer requirements for all the way through to in-service support. And, and mirroring that are the green activities that you've just seen on that, di that flow diagram of all the things that quality professionals should be involved in. That's, that's, your, that's the workload. And the, more, the better we do it, the further upstream we, we manage to take the project. We don't, we're not coming down, we're not taking problems of design through the manufacturing stage, taking them down, so we're picking them up early on. And uh, that's a model that fits in very neatly with the, the modern quality professional. Any questions? One of the big changes that's happened since the late um, 50s has been the change in management styles. About that time, uh, McGregor identified what was called Theory X, which was command and control management. And that was the mode of operation that's happened for the past 2,000 years. That's what the Romans ran on. That's what we have military model that we ran on. And the first industrial people used the military model as their management model, which is understandable. So Taylor's model relied heavily on command and control, people following what they were told to do. To do. McGregor and others like him, as though Uchi, um, they said there are psychological factors that affect the human pe people that, that uh, don't necessarily want to do that. They want to think things out for themselves, quite rightly. And of course, what else, the other thing that changed, people were more educated, more knowledgeable. They didn't need to be told what to do anymore. They could see what was needed and uh, they, they could get on and do it. So these, this change came about. But it hasn't gone as far quickly as we thought it would do. Because there are still many companies out there that are running on command and control principles, which is a, a real shame. But there are other companies that are successfully running on, on theory Y, which is empowerment management, and theory Z, which is autonomous management. Autonomous is where leadership is delegated to the lowest possible level, 
and uh, work teams decide among themselves who's going to run that work team and they make their decisions at that level. That's all hung together by policy deployment where they have common objectives set by the top or, and agreed by the, by the bottom in the hierarchy. So, but, you know, collaborating across organisations is, is the toughest gig that most of us face because people don't naturally want to um, discuss with other people their, whatever they think their responsibilities are and getting that to happen in an organisation is very tough. It has to start at the top most of the time and it has to be the way that we, we're going to work and that people have to work on it. It's, e it's, it's much easier of course <coughs> for those uh, companies that have made the transition. If possible the quality professional should build it into his terms of reference so he's not seen as a trans a, uh, what do we call it when we tread on foreign ground? Never mind. Uh, it, um, but build it into terms of reference and give people the license to, to go across uh, boundaries and such. Obviously it needs good human skills, soft skills to work on the relationships. The quality engineer has to make himself useful. He must be a good finder. He finds things that he no longer goes there beating them up with a, with a policeman's stick. He's there to find things that are going well. He has to be a good problem solver because then he becomes valuable. To, and, um, and, and the last one I put it in there is that most people say, oh, it doesn't work because it doesn't come from the top. There is quite often situations where you can seduce them from the middle of the organisation. Wherever you are in the organisation, you can start this stuff tomorrow. You can go out there and, and uh, work with the, your colleagues and such to get quality management introduced wherever you are in, in the pecking order. The systems thinker. Quality management by, by itself is a system. So we have to be systems thinkers. Quality professionals have to be systems thinkers. And the, the standard itself was, came out of scientific management. And the management theory has moved on from that, as we've talked about, which means that we can try and get as much of this into the, the new standards that are coming along. One of the big debates at TC176 on the new ISO 9001 standard is about this subject. Because they're trying to introduce this soft stuff piecemeal into the standard instead of starting again because they don't want to change it all because people get upset because it's too much of a change. But on the other hand, they'd like to introduce some, some of this soft stuff. So they're caught between the two. So ISO 9000 is a hybrid. More, 9000 are one more than 9000. 9, um, but the quality professionals are there to help the transition. They should have that, those skills to be able to, to work on this, collab this, the, this system thinking. Now, there are other people, system thinking is a wide, wide subject, and, and the systems people themselves get themselves tied up in all sorts of knots because there's a soft side, there's a systems, the engineering side, the hard side, and in the middle there's Akroff and, and Co that do things their way. All of it's good stuff. I think you, by learning about it, you're in a position to influence. Quality professional is always in a position to offer changes to the system, improvements to the system, using the principles laid down under systems thinking. One of the principles that come out of this is that management are responsible for the system. So when things go wrong in the system, they, go, they take responsibility for it. It used, to be, it, used to be, it used to be the case, I go into a company, something had gone wrong, and the first thing they would say, well, we've reprimanded the operator. If it was really bad, we've sacked the operator. And if we haven't sacked him, we're about to sack the foreman out there as well. And I'd say, well, what about you? Isn't it your system? What's gone wrong with your system? Tell me what went wrong with your system. And of course, then, then, then they had to think about it, because oh, maybe I picked the wrong operator, or maybe I did this or whatever. A classic case at BA Systems, 
in the shipyard, no, on the, on the, on the artillery section at Barrow. Beautiful NC machine, experienced operator, titanium castings, very expensive, 90,000 pounds a time, perfect quality. He goes ill one day, and the, and the foreman, in his haste, he says to the operator, not the operator, the young apprentice who's 19 years of age, I want you to go on that machine. And, 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 and the poor little boy is shaking like this. But by the end of the day, he managed to make a non-conforming part with 90, 80, 90,000 pounds of scrap. And uh, so what do we do? Sack the uh, apprentice? Or are we going to sack the, uh, the, uh, the foreman? That's what I mean to say. It's, it's not the operator's fault in a case like that. It was clearly management's fault by not having a, a backup training person or, or to stop the process. Workers work in the system. They, they do what they're expected to do, whatever instructions are laid down. A system is the sum of all processes to achieve the aim of the customer satisfaction. That's the total system all the way through. And performance comes out of the system. So the better the system, the better performance. Improving the system improves the performance. They sound very simple, much more difficult to make, make, make happen. Any questions? You're a very quiet lot. I thought I'd have a lot of, a lot of questions up here. I thought, well, this lot looks like they could give me some hard questions. Just, just a little bit of theory. George Box is probably one of the, he died not long ago. He's one of the great thinkers, or systems thinkers. He was 90 odd when he went. He was a statistician that grew up in, in England and went to live in the United States. But this is Box's theory, which I rather like, because he says, to improve profound knowledge, you need to turn theory into practice, practice into theory, and work at improvement. Ono says, common sense tells us that the world is flat. Common sense is, is always wrong. So in other words, if you've got a common sense answer, go and look for the unreasonable answer. And Box's favourite quote is that all models are wrong, but some are more useful than others. And, and I think about all the money that we've squandered in the <coughs> banks based on models. They were all working on financial models. They were making wrong decisions with models that hadn't had a clue about a, a non-standard distribution. They all worked on a normal distribution. And when they got a skew in the, in the distribution, they came out with the wrong numbers and they lost a lot of money. And uh, it tells us that we have to be as system, as system thinkers, quality professional, need to be on our guard. Don't let people make decisions based on, on uh, no, without theory. It sounds simple. But, you know, teamwork gives us synergy. We know that those of us that follow football, we know the great teams always operate as a system. And they get synergy out of that time. So <coughs> the, the better our teamwork, the more synergy we get, the more energy we get out of what we're doing, and the better the, the, better the work that we produce. Consensus, which came out of uh, empowerment management, gives us the buy-in to decision-making. When we, when we have consensus, everyone buys into the decision. It doesn't mean to say we, we agree with it, but we agree enough with it to live with it. If we can live with it, then it, we have consensus. Learning to work together is, is vital. Quality improvement teams make things better and save money for the company. Process improvement check is a way of teams finding out how well they're working together as a team. And the last one, team building, is what I hope we all try to do with our teams. Long ago, uh, Deming and Schuhart wrote this, and what he said is that what we need in industry, they were talking about, was not a whole pile of white-coated statisticians to tell us what to do, but we needed statistically minded scientists, engineers, technicians, and quality professionals. And uh, of course, um, project managers and project engineers and such. Because with the, aid, with, the aid of, with the aid of statistics, we're able to make 
sure that, that we're working, we can predict how our work is going to be. It's given us predictions, it's given us stable processes, it's given us prediction of what's going to come out of the processes. And we make more right decisions than wrong decisions, which, which is why statistics are so important to all of us that work in industry. So I'm not going to put anything more on, on the subject other than that as a statement to think about as an individual, how that applies to you in your work and the work around you. Because the more you use it, the more you find it useful. And the more useful it is, the more beneficial it will be to the, the, the work that you're doing. And it's, um, the, the bit I like is that it's not, to do with, it's not to do with statisticians, it's to do with the individuals. Metrology is, is one of the lost qualities of quality management. Years ago, metrology was hot, hot subjects and, and uh, arguments about gauges and calibration and all those sort of things used to happen. And then it was sort of became, went out of fashion. When quality management went up market, metrology was one of those old fashioned things we, we used to do. Do we still do it? Do we still, do we still calibrate gauges? No, we dispose of them. <laughs> dispose of them. Well, I hope you would do. I'd be appalled if you didn't. Put input into relevant validation verification that we have to do. But I think it's because we work in multi industries up here where we have to look at compliance legislation regulations because we wouldn't actually make the money that the Chancellor of the Exchequer actually receives. Well, I mean, people that work with these things know how important it is to have them calibrated. Calibration. Well, the cost of calibration is yeah. more expensive now than the cost of right. replacement. So it has become a lot um, more disposable. To just dispose of right, I can understand that. Um, but anyway, um, the role is more than just calibration because we want to know how good they are, repeat how repeatable they are, how good rep re reproducibility they are. Those other factors of variation in gauges. It's quite, certainly on precision machining, Quite often, the uh, gauges consume up to 60% of the variation in the process. It's terrible, and people don't even know, don't haven't known about it in the past. But of course, the, the lesson, lesson for the quality engineers is that metrology was built on the foundation uh, that technology moved on because it was built on this ability to be able to measure. Without that ability to measure, we would never have got where we are today in terms of precision. Instru uh, instruments and technology. The improvement facilitator. In the, new, in the new ISO 9001 standard, they changed it from continual improvement to improvement. But they've left the words out that supports it. Because this idea came from the CQI. We're to blame for this. Because in our paper, we said that there were three elements of, of improvement. Continual, breakthrough from Dr. Duran, and transformation, which is logical. What well, in the past we had continual in the standard, these other ones were not seen to be worthy of put, put it into standard. The reason why we put it in there is because 9000 standard is meant to represent the whole 20 standards in the 9000 series, not just 9001. 9001 is a basic quality management standard. We put the three in to cover. 9004, <coughs> and if there is one that's going to come about about, um, about transformation, then that will be ready for it. So that's the reason why the th we put the change in there. Uh, what they did, they, they adopted it for 9001, and they've had thousands upon thousands of people complaining from all around the world that it should be continual. So it'll probably go back to continual. That's the way it stays with us. The quality professionals should be able to work on all those elements of, of improvement and depends on where we are in the life cycle that all of those events may well come to pass from normal continued improvement when you're steady state breakthrough when you need to improve things in a hurry transformation is when the business or the industry is going through a trans transformation that new skills are needed <coughs> Uh, 
This uh, subject applies not just to manufacturing, it's new, new product development, customer value creation in marketing, business process innovation, and so on. You can read it for yourself. So th this whole concept of improvement has become a, a development for the quality professional. These are some of the skills that the quality professional, if, if he doesn't already have it, should be working on improving. Understanding variation, we've talked about. Systems thinking, we've talked about. Process focus. And that, by that, I don't mean just the, um, the process approach that's listed in 9001. I mean, understanding st stability, uh, behavior, repeatability, and process capability. But the ability to work with people, soft skills, teamwork, facilitation, and the seven quality tools. Five S's for a quality environment. People say, how do we start quality management? We start it on day one by doing the five S's. Any room in the house, we can improve within half an hour. You take the five S's out, practice them immediately, leave behind the yellow tags that show the things that are going to be changed, and come back tomorrow and finish it off. Do that in every room in the university. It'd be amazing how, how, imp how impressive the place will look in a couple of weeks. I, it's never failed for me. I've always done it first, first day. I don't go in my office on the first day. I go straight, which I thought was the untidiest part of the plant. We'll start off here. And I usually take the MD with me because he'll, he'll be converted. He'll walk around with yellow tanks in his pocket and put them on things that he doesn't like and such. But that's for another occasion. Some more methods. Some people don't like plan, do, study, act. I've got no problem with that. You've got plenty of others. Quality improvement story from Ishikawa. Demayek from Six Sigma. Eight Discipline from Ford. 9000 of Ford was an honest attempt to produce a, a standard for continued improvement. I don't know how many people have used 9000 of Ford. Had any luck with it? Anyone? Hillary? Yeah. It works. I, I, the Institute put about 180 <laughs> recommendations into that standard. And I was on the committee that went through it and defended most of those changes. And uh, so we have, a, we have an interest in, in that standard, the, our Institute. We did that. Kaizen was the original Japanese continuous improvement that came from Japan. And I remember this guy giving a presentation at the the Institute of Electrical Engineers. And an old boy stood up and he said, but Mr. Emma, he said, all of what you're talking about is common sense. We've been doing that. He said, but why isn't common sense common practice? And, and that's the issue with this. You can look at it and without touching it, do it. And the last one, not always applicable to every industry, but Taguchi came out with some very simple ways of doing design of experiments. This is working at improving performance by understanding the variances of the processes, process inputs and outputs, and very quickly you have an improvement. Toyota, for instance, used to, used to be in the region of about 7,000 Taguchi experiments every single year, because what this is doing is not just improving quality, it's reducing <coughs> costs and taking waste out of the system. So all three things come along with simple design of experiments techniques. A skill not often seen with quality engineers, but anyone that worked for me would have been on the course and, and had an example of doing that when they came back. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have that one? This, I, I, I make no excuse, came from BA Systems. My last project was the M77 lightweight howitzer for the US Marine Corps. They, they, they placed an old, BA Systems in Barrow, which is the old Vickers factory, won the, won the bid against all the competition around the world, and um, we were given, given the contract. We were, get, we were put on a bonus of a million dollars for quality and delivery, quality first. And this is the, this is the, 
the um, continuous improvement plan that we put together to describe all the improvement activities that we were doing. From policy improvement at the top level, that was a management improvement team, training, target costing to reduce cost of products or to stop costs rising, value stream mapping, job stoppers, things that were causing the process to slow down, methods. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see every, behind every one, of the, every one of those things there was an activity for improvement. Now that is, it, when people say, well, there's no such thing as a continuous improvement system, there's an example of one where you put it all together and you collectively measure how much improvement benefit you get from all of that. And it's lots of money. That thing was turning over two million, three million pounds per year profit from just those activities there. So it's worth thinking about it in that, that way, drawing it out that way. And even if you're not doing it, you can always start uh, one or other of the elements of it. So I left it in there for, for those that are interested in that sort of thing to work on. Project by project, I put this, this, this track in there for those guys among us that from projects. One of the key features is this business of project by project improvement. The project has to learn. People have to learn on that project. And the importance of that is it cannot be overemphasized. Learning from experience from, from the project, what went right, what went wrong. Use the knowledge of the performance of the system during the project to improve the system or the discipline, we've talked about that, with the idea of optimising the best we can do. If it's not built into your projects, you need to do it. If you're not teaching it, you need to teach it. <laughs> <laughs> well, management used to get away with this. They used to say, right, you guys, go off and run in, play in your quality circles and come back with the goodies. Then they said, well, hey, you're not getting away with that. Your job is quality function or quality policy deployment, that should be. That's bottom up, top down policy making involving the workforce, making sure all the, all, all the value flows on the shop floor are visual so people can see them. And more, more importantly, go to GEMBA, go to where the work is being produced. Management need to go there. Idea systems that uh, can collect ideas from the workplace and from, from top management and continued improvement activities in the workplace. That's all the manager's job to manage those processes. And what that gives us is quality-wide quality management, company-wide quality management. Anybody do any of that? No? Oh, well, there's an opportunity. There's opportunities to improve, to improve things then. Supply chain, um, I'm, start, I'm going to start at the bottom. 60% of the value and 46% of the profit typically comes from the supply chain. Having read that, you wonder why we don't pay more attention to it or why companies don't pay more attention to it. What they tend to do is just let it go on its own until it goes wrong and then they're out there in their thousands to try and fix it. But there is more to it than, than, than just buying on price because... If you don't work, at work on the cultural sides of the relationship and get, align the, uh, what you believe in at the top, it will go wrong. If you, be, if you have a quality first policy and they have a profit first pro pro policy, it will never work. They will do things that won't, but won't fit in with your relationship. Working together for better relationship is, is an ISO principle. There are some supplier quality fundamental concepts that apply to the supply base, like buying on, on process capability and not on money alone. Evolution, selection, performing, performance rating systems are all useful measures of performance. And overall, managing the supply chain quality is a pretty important function for any organisation. And that's the role of the quality professional to do that. They, by going out there, they, they'll bring knowledge back of what's going on out there. They'll, you'll get confidence of, of how well they're doing or not so. 
And I've added logistics in there because this day and age with Kanbans and just in time and all the rest of it, logistics is a pretty important discipline for the supply chain. And it's interesting to see so many um, companies that outsource to Asia and China and those places are now bringing it back because the thing that they misunderstood was the cost of logistics when things go wrong. Shipping people out to China to fix things or delays to production because it's on the high sea or wherever it is. It's got to the point where there's no reason why we can't make it in this country. This country, these days, more often than not, and I'm not talking about your industry, but I'm talking about mostly manufacturing, the costs, labour costs in manufacturing are no more than 15%, which means it's no, it's no point in producing in Asia and shipping it halfway around the world. You might as well, just as well, make it in Kirk and Tillich or, or Aberdeen as there and, 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 and ship it from the UK, around the UK. And it's, and it's not difficult to see it because all the automotive companies, they don't buy from China, not, not many parts from China, they'll buy from Europe, where they got within one day's driving distance to the plants. So supply chain, get the relationship right, get the fundamentals right, um, work on all the elements and treat it as a serious, serious subject. This is the model that we developed on, uh, on Stingray, the Stingray Mark II, and that we said before we went into this, because we would had a disaster with the, with the um, heavyweight torpedo, and we decided we we're going to do better on the supply chain this time round. So we defined what was best in class for each of the different supply commodities. We'll see what their the responses were and how they described how they fitted into that. Uh, assessment methodology, and then we, we had a weighting system for process capability, production capability, and so on. And we only went for the top 20% of the Pareto. So when we sat down with the ministry and we sat down with the project managers, because the project director ran this operation, instead of buying it on people's opinion, they bought, every part was bought based on that analysis. It was factual. And it was all done in one morning with the ministry. That something that used to take about three months was finished in a morning by looking at those charts. That's the power of quality management. Devising a, a chart of, of that description to provide data. That's a statistical chart as much as any other chart. It's there, there to be used. And it works. This is the age of mentors, coaches, and knowledge coordinators. All of them touchy-feely. It's great to have a mentor. How many people have got mentors? I've got one. He's 93 years of age. I have a hard time keeping him alive. <laughs> I have to... <laughs> I have to speak to him. I've worked. I've actually worked in the industry, and so I've had damn good mentors. Well, there you are. A mentor is a... A very important person in anyone's life. If you're fortunate to get a mentor, and it doesn't matter who it is, it's just you know, even if you're going to bounce ideas off of them, go for it. Because they're in a position to pass on knowledge in an organised way. His job is to pass on knowledge from a previous generation to the new generation. This is what we did, this works, that one doesn't work. That's, that gives you knowledge to help you and gives you confidence to do things in a better way. So I do recommend uh, um, get, getting yourself a mentor. Coaching is part of the mentor's task, is to coach the individual in new ways of working or if they want to, f want to understand any statistical methods or any systems issues. And I'm remi we're reminded here of Winston Church, we've come up with this, if you have the knowledge, let others light their candles with it. That sounds a bit soft for Winston Church. I think he was probably referring to his cigar, not his, not telling other people. <laughs> but, but either way, very important. Quality becomes the knowledge coordinator. 
In, in many organisations these days, quality management is regarded as a discipline where knowledge is captured and put into a central repository that the next project can go into to see how, what, what information they need to, to work on. I'm thinking of process capabilities in the design process, the design engineers have something to work on rather than just arbitrary to tolerances on, on drawings and things of that nature. Um, performance results, all sorts of things. Where it gets lost is, is the volume of data that's around these days and, and trying to store volumes of data into a knowledge management system makes it difficult for people to retrieve it and it rather defeats the objects in the first place. But a well-defined knowledge management system will be able to collect and um, transform data quickly. I'm not going to read all these up. There's two pages of this. This is what I use as my mentor in standard. And it's, and it's about <coughs> what Dr. Deming thought about the use of statistical methods and such. And it was a reminder that when we handle data, what we should look for and what we should be wary of. There's two pages of it. I'm not going to go through it. There's the second one. This one is, is the, actually is the theory of variation. So this is why we should be interested in variation in the ISO 9001 standard, which we've, we've uh, raised with them. And uh, when it comes to quality problems, I don't know about your industry, but most industries I've worked in, variation is the cause of the biggest number of problems that we have. And by variation, I mean human variation as well. People's, people's way they operate or they behave or, um, or the way they assemble things or, or, or you get the machine capability data and you get the human variability data. So it's a big, big subject to get into and understand. Well, people have arguments over the difference between mentors and coaches, but a coach has a definite role. A coach is there to coach a department or an individual in the body of knowledge and help them implement it, uh, help them uh, take experience from and then put it into practice. And what I'm saying here is that instead of spending so much time auditing, coaching would be a much more value-adding uh, not because audit, there's nothing wrong with auditing, it's because coaching is aimed at improving. Auditing quite often in the past is seen as a, trying to find things that are wrong. And I know these days we talk about auditing for improvement, and there's nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is that if, if the amount of time that went into coaching was the same as the amount of time that went into auditing, we'd have better processes. That's all, that's all it meant, and it's a personal opinion on the subject. Quality profession should make sure his cool t toolkit is up to date, come up to date with standards, journals, and branch meetings. Like, I'm pleased to see so many people here tonight. This is where knowledge starts. You'll, there'll be ideas here that you'll agree with or not agree with. You'll go away and look at them and, and, and decide um, what, whether you're going to learn from them. One thing, this came from Peter Drucker. He said that the Industrial Revolution changed the source of wealth from the land to, cap to capital. Capital became more available and less pressures up until 1895. The big thing of the 20th century was human knowledge, and that becomes a precious commodity. People that fire people, make people redundant, or they fire them and all that stuff, they're throwing value out the door. They don't understand what they're doing. They denude their companies of knowledge that's, that's been there for decades. And by doing it, they waste. They let them, when it comes to making things again, they'll be short of the right degree of knowledge. And that, unfortunately, it happens in our, in our country more often than it should do because we're, we're hit by the, the short-term profit things and, and all those dreadful things. So look at, look at knowledge, human knowledge is a precious commodity 
and look for ways of u u utilising it productively. And of course, in all of this, individuals, they need the energy to make things happen. This, we're talking about the quality professional now. They need a mind that's clear and that has the ability to think, think problems out. You need to have the people's skills to be able to get on with other people and to work, make their work um, harmonious. They need to develop good working habits, job st stability. And, I, and this is me, I speak with data, not fog. If we speak with data, we get to the truth. If we speak with <coughs> perception, hearsay, opinion and guessing, well, we get somewhere else. And the bottom line is, we should, have, we should be ethical in, in what we're doing. I don't know about you, I've had um, people from a well-known um, auditing company come in to see me. Well, how would you like it? Would you like it easy or would you like it hard? <laughs> I thought, I'm, I'm not sure what he's offering me here. <laughs> So I said, do you mind if I have the telephone number of your manager? He said, why? I said, I'm going to phone him up and tell him you're coming back to the office because you're not staying here. But it's true. There are outfits out there that... Uh, um, and these days it's getting worse, I think. Oh, absolutely. I is it? Say, yes, it is. I am concerned that we have built a very strong multi-industries up here. But I have to say the external lead auditors out there, I have challenged quite a few. And it's going to damage the industries that we've actually built. I think it's already damaging because we don't go forward. You, you, all of you must have a moan about 9,001 sometimes. I know that goes on and it goes round and it gets churned and churned and churned and churned. And what is it we don't like? We don't like third party auditing because they don't... The, the, the pipe, he who pays the piper plays the tune. So the third party auditor has to be ethic, very ethical in his work, not to be swayed by the company that he's, he's working on. I, I use the example of BAE system because it's in the past now. On the, on the astute submarine, it came to a halt. They couldn't move forward, it was coming to a halt, but they couldn't assemble anything more on this submarine. <coughs> because of the quality deficiencies that had happened in the factory. Not working to drawings, not following instructions, you, you, not following the CAD descriptions and all that, all that stuff. The MD got fired, but he's got another job at Railtrack. <laughs> God help Railtrack. Um, we got the blue ribbon provider of the auditing in. They have one man doing three days on a plant with 16,000 people. Wonder, I wonder why he didn't find anything wrong with that thing like that. We produced a 64 page report of all the things that were wrong. That comp blue chip company came in with six auditors for three weeks and came out with a huge bundle of things that was wrong with the system. We fixed all of that and now we make submarines the way we should in the first place. That's a, and that's our money that we lost. Four million, four billion, sorry, pounds we squandered by not having proper quality auditing going on. So ethics are an important play in all of this stuff. So I, I put these words down to sum all what we've just been through up. The quality professional plays a significant role in the development and improvement of products and services around the world. He's still there, he survived the changes that we've had. The, the idea is that they, they need to be evolving into a more value-added role, which I hope I've demonstrated tonight the sort of things that they should be doing. There are technical challenges that we face on software, software errors, systems errors, nanotechnology coming along, microelectronics are difficult things to do. No matter whether it's making washing machines or motor cars, all of them struggle to control these in the same way as they control mechanical parts and electrical parts. So there needs to be new thinking in this, those areas, and it should come from the quality profession and how to control these things better. Our body of knowledge is still the best tool set in, 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 the, in the market, so we should be proud, proud 
proud of it, our, our tool set, and uh, the profession will expand over the next few years to include people that are not necessarily quality only professionals, but there'll be project engineers, there'll be operations engineers, there'll be designers, design people that work in design, they'll, they'll adopt the quality disciplines as an extra means of, of improving what they do. And because the principle behind it is that people are responsible for their own processes. We don't need uh, inspectors or, or quality engineers hovering over our activities every day of the week because we're frightened of doing it properly. So by spreading the discipline out to these other places, we'll be in a position to have far greater influence than what we currently have. And I hope to see the day when the Institute has as many non-quality professionals as, as it has quality professionals now. And that will depend on people like yourselves going out there and spreading the good word to wherever we're working and to get them interested in doing things in better ways. And all that leads to prosperity of our nation. Because one thing we found about the banks going bust then despite all the government money they poured back into those vaults, we still haven't recovered any of the gross domestic product that they produced formerly. They, they, we're now down at 12% on, on financial services. It's never going to go any higher than, much higher than that. Our recovery depends on making things, taking things with raw material and turn them into products that people want. And it's not very difficult, really. We, all of us, we buy washing machines, we buy cars, we buy all this stuff every day of the week. How much of it is made in the UK? Very little. So we need to get that message across. I know that the government, current coalition, have got an automotive uh, council which is looking at expanding the automotive uh, activities in the UK. But we missed opportunities, like the transit van that was designed in Essex, the white van man, He'll never be the same again if the, if, if the transit's made in Spain. It won't, it won't be the same. It won't, have that, won't be the Dagenham dustbin that it was at one time, or, or, it, or it won't uh, ever have come from the design, uh, design um, boards of, uh, of the Dunton Research Centre. So things like that they, they could do would help us get back into this stuff. So there's a sort of a message that I leave. And there's one more message. I call it the 15 year rule because it's amazing that every 15 years, management forget the lessons of the past. And when I say that normally, people stand up and say, it doesn't take 15 years. I said, I know that. I just give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Most teaching and, and all learning, I'm gonna get into trouble with the academics here, comes from existing knowledge. It's not knowledge that's not new knowledge. Uh, not all of it's new knowledge anyway. So it need, we need to, this learning thing is back to George Box's diagram. The theory into practice produces new knowledge. And it's a combination of ac academia and the, and the workplace out there. And we're not very good at it. The Germans are excellent at it. They have sabbaticals. Most engineers, when they're 40, they have a year out as a sabbatical. They take their knowledge back into university and they put that back into the system of what they've, what they've learnt in their career up to that time. We've never been very partial to that up to now, but it should be one of the, the Institute's aims, education aims, is to get similar systems developed in the UK to, for us to learn on that one. Never forget, youth has the energy but age has the wisdom. I say that because I've got grey hair. When I, was, when I was younger, I used to always vote for the other lot, but these days I have to hang a vote for the silver heads. Don't forget the wisdom of the grey beards. Beware of the myths. They keep coming back in organisations. Not all of them are true. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Any questions? Yes, sir. And you can have clarification. Why we are discussing about um, the quality planner? We said that the quality manager has to compare the quality of his product and goods. 
with that of the competitors. Now, that suggests that the quality manager um, uses the standard uh, uh, uses the standard of the competitors as a standard for quality. Well, first of all, he doesn't do it on his own. He has to do it in conjunction with engineering, normally, or manufacturing. It depends on what you want to learn from it. If you take the case, I, I did it on the diesel injectors. We took diesel injectors from the various Bosch plants around Europe and we measured them. We found out what they did well better than us and what they did worse than us and why they did it worse. Maybe they didn't bother because it wasn't so important. So in a case like that, we're there to learn about process knowledge and about design knowledge. With that, those two things, we were able to put it into our injectors and be more competitive and be able to go back to Mercedes-Benz and, and take business away from Robert Bosch. That's the example that, that I use on that, on that front. Did, did that answer you? Yep, no, that's a good that's a good question. People are saying, what about innovation? That's true. But there's no reason why you can't be looking at innovation when you're stripping components down. We used to take an engine every month of the competition and strip it down. And when it was a Toyota, it may well have carbon fiber uh, tappet uh, rings or whatever else like that. That's innovation. So you want to be wary of what and what uh, what Samsung did with, um, with Apple, of course, was to steal half of their uh, priority knowledge and put it into their products and got away with it almost. Um, you're right, I mean, but they did exactly that, didn't they? They went out and bought Apple with parts, stripped them down, saw how it worked and then built, quickly built their own version of it. Um, it's all fear and love and war, you know, that's what you get away with on that front. But um, innovation, comes from people's ideas. Innovation very rarely comes out of individuals' heads unless your name is Bill Jobs or whatever his name was. He, he, he was a genius. And geniuses do come up with ideas. Most of the other innovations come from product development. Like people look for a solution to a particular problem and they come up and find it. And that's why some of the Taguchi methods are very good for innovation because you want to take cost out of a product one of the Gucci exercises and find what's important to reliability or, ver or wear, wear or whatever and change the materials to so you can use a lesser quality material and things of that nature. One of the things that British Leyland did very badly was to use expensive materials for doing mundane functions. And of course that finished up with, with a more expensive vehicle. Any more questions? Well, thanks very much for coming along tonight. And, um, and if you want to ask me any questions, you have my email address on the screen. And uh, by all means, use the um, data in that presentation to help your own careers. And I wish you very well with your quality careers. Thank you.